Good morning. Or I guess it's afternoon now. Um, so this is the 45th annual Dodge Lecture, which is incredible all by itself. Uh, hopefully you all got um, little pamphlets. And if you look in there, um, not only will you see nice, kind words about our speaker, but on the page before that, you'll see the list of the Dodge lectures that we've had in the past. And it's a who's who of endocrinology. And it's in honor of Dr. Dodge, who is an endocrinologist back when endocrine first started um, at St. Luke's. And he's been honored. And we put the speakers through a bit of a grind because they they visit uh, all three institutions, um, and the endocrinologists in town. Uh, we did that last night. Uh, we enjoy that, and then uh, at all the at KU and here, they will uh, interact with the fellows. We'll do that after his lecture. We'll have lunch in the, with the fellows and and the the uh, uh, Dodge lecture. Um, Dr. Schaefer is, uh, uh, has a lot of titles and his CV is heavy, okay? Um, he is the executive director of Mount Sinai Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery and professor of medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And before that, he actually developed the transgender medicine uh, and was director at Boston Medical Center. Um, he has helped develop some of the guidelines um, and was the inaugural president of the U.S. Professional Association for Transgender Medicine. He's also participated in the development uh, and guidelines for how transgender athletes fit into um, uh, competition. Um, and uh, we are just thrilled and delighted to again have such an outstanding person uh, as our Dodge lecture. And we're delighted to have you, Dr. Safer. Thank you. Um, thank you for a very kind introduction. Um, it's really an honor to, um, to, to, to be here um, to, to, to give the Dodge Lecture. And if you look at that list and are an endocrinologist, then it's an intimidating list. Um, so it makes it even, even more of an honor to be here. Um, what I wanted to do for, for today's Grand Rounds is um, look at uh, transgender medicine or gender-affirming care um, a little bit with the, um, some of the um, lens um, that I, um, uh, through which I look, um, which is um, as a doctor, as a, as a medicine person, and so I'm not going, it, it's not, the, the talk isn't focused on identifying a problem so much as talking about the care and how we're understanding biology and what some of our strategies are and quote unquote what the right thing is to do. It's kind of funny because we just had an election, right? And you know, there are the people who define the problem and the people who define the solution. So this is getting a little bit more towards that ladder, maybe. Um, and I just, um, I'm going to focus a little bit too on some biases that I think we have and just um, give you some, some, some of my alternative thinking. So I have no financial relationships on the subject, and here, that's my outline, I guess, saying what I just said already. Um, so kind of framing the basis for our current strategy as, 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 as medical people, as biologically oriented people, um, and then also the, the strategies that are involved in the game. So, so uh, some of these talks, in addition to um, pointing out um, problems of neglect, which I told you already I'm not going to do, um, they also begin with um, terminology. And I actually do, I, w I used to skip that too, but I decided that I have to do that just a tiny little bit because I want to refocus folks a 
alphabet in that space. So usually these talks open up with somebody telling you things like um, gender is a construct, which if you speak English well, you might know, and sex is what you use to refer to biology. And then they proceed to have a, um, be unable to define anything else because um, they're just not being precise with their terminology. And so, um, so they, um, so, so my plea for us medically minded and scientifically minded folks is to be specific. And so, therefore, when you talk about, so I don't even use the word gender usually unless I'm talking very, very globally about parts of speech. Um, but if I'm talking about gender identity, I talk about that. And if I'm talking about gender expression, I talk about that. And if I'm talking about um, uh, sex, um, uh, global biology, I will talk about um, chromosomes and genes and whatever it is, but I'll be specifically in a, specific in identifying them so that we um, really can be precise in, in, in terms of what it is that we're talking about. And then um, here's part of, of the mess. Um, we have this term called gender identity, um, which uses the term gender, which is a construct, and identity, which is something that you choose, which we medical people are using to refer to something that is biological. It's that area in your brain that tells you what sex you are and what role you're supposed to play in reproduction. That we have animals probably have it too. We just, you know, are gaining an appreciation of this being part of sexual reproduction. Um, and uh, maybe we need two terms, because our social science colleagues sometimes use this term the way the language suggests. It's a construct and how they want to self, how people might want to self-identify, but that's not what we're treating with hormones or interventions. Um, we're, we're, we're treating that, that biology when, especially, it doesn't align with other elements of somebody's biology. And um, like I say, maybe we need a second term. Um, and then I, one other um, term that I want to reference here is the, um, the, um, the term gender dysphoria is a mental health term. We just spent half a century thinking of being transgender as a mental health concern, and it's in the DSM. And, the, um, and we, we use these mental health style definitions, but there, if, you, if you have a certain biology and certain other biology and there's a little incongruence and it makes you transgender or what, however you want to label it or in a non-binary sort of way in a you know, gender diverse, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're sad about it. You know, you don't have gender dysphoria, you know, so, so that, that, whole, that whole framing is wrong. Um, right now, we are stuck with this label in, um, because WHO ICD-10 has this is the only label that refers to trans people. So we're stuck with the label, but the whole framing is just wrong. Um, and if you have people who are looking for interventions to better align some parts of biology with other parts of biology, that's transgender. We label that gender incongruence. The hand is waved. Um, I got a thing that says your mic is negative three. OK. There. Got it. All right. Well, the people who are online, maybe they should be in person, you know? <laughs> well, you can try that and see if it works. If you just get uh, right, those are intentionally off. I learned from the AV guy. <laughs> All right. OK, no trouble. All right. Um, so gender dysphoria, um, so this is going to change. We know it already. It, like the committees have been met. WHO ICD-11 is going to get rid of this term and um, is going to re and, and there's going to have a new sexual health chapter where there's something called gender incongruence, whatever you think of that word. That's beside the point. It's to, but it's framing it better. And then people who have gender incongruence might be it might be reasonable to do some interventions. And if these people have But, that, but that's kind of an independent thing. All right, enough on terms. And I'm a little, um, yeah, who knows how, the, how, how the, the sound is. But we here in the room are doing OK. And I guess we're the, we're the most important ones. OK, so what I want to do is, um, for openers, I just want to um, bring people up to speed on how we got here in establishment medicine. Just kind of go back the last 10 or 20 years or, or so. 
identity. And even as I get there, I'll show you what we don't know and where the areas of interest potentially for, for, for learning might lie. Um, and so it was the case, um, and I was taught this myself when I was in medical school in the 80s, that, um, that, that gender identity was maybe um, from your environment, your parents told you what sex you are, and you kind of, um, and you can go with that, or it's a societal construct, or it's a passive response to your anatomy. You simply um, looked, you know, between your legs, and you saw it was there, and you kind of been going with the flow, as it were. Um, but the, um, but, but what we've become clearer, and there's this paradigm to show to understanding the it as the biological entity that I just referenced. And I want to just kind of buzz through some of the um, data that support that. Um, and um, I kind of divide the data into four buckets based on you know, how strong those data are in convincing me. So it's a little arbitrary, my arbitrary division. Um, and the first is historical attempts to try to manipulate gender identity among people who are intersex or have DSDs, differences of sexual differentiation. And we, we, we learned, I learned when I did PEDS endo, um, that um, because gender identity is passive, that what you could do for an intersex person is if they had an ambig ambiguous genitalia, you would do a surgery that made sense surgically, and then you would convince that person through upbringing to have a gender identity to match those genitals. And that was standard operating procedure, like I say, for probably 50 years or so. And the, the paper that best illustrates um, the folly of that and what's really going on is a New England Journal paper from about almost 20 years ago um, uh, where they, um, it's, it, it's the prettiest paper here, and basically what it is is the, um, they, um, it, it's a group, um, a surgical group at Johns Hopkins treating um, kids with um, cloacal extrafemal development of the GIGU tract, requires a bunch of surgery. Um, so basically everybody gets a vaginoplasty because that's the better established surgery. And that includes all the people with X of people who are, um, who say they're trans or gender diverse or, or whatever, um, the, um, the, the, you get numbers like a half a percent or a full percent or, or something of the population might say that about themselves, which just means that 99% say that they're not transgender, right? So therefore, if you have six, um, a bunch of kids, this is 16 people here, you would predict that maybe all or maybe 15 of 16, if they are have XY chromosomes, would have m most things aligned otherwise, including their gender identity. They'd have male gender identity. So basically, you take 16 people where you guess that most or all have male gender identity, give them all vaginas you, um, surgically when they're, in, when, they're, when, when they're infants, and you raise them as girls, you give them very, what you stereotypically, what you believe to be female sounding uh, names, and, and really, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I realize this is, a, this is a younger crowd, but if you're familiar with the Truman Show, um, and if you're not, you should look it up, the, um, it's, um, it's, um, it's exactly that. Um, and the, the kids only learn their medical history when they turn age 18. Well, what, um, the, the story here um, is that four of these kids around junior high told the surgeons, it's a fairly complex surgery, so they had annual at least follow-up um, post-op um, um, and, and even repeat surgeries when they were younger. So they were seeing the surgeons um, long after infant dumb. And they, um, anyway, four of them living as girls, given feminine names, being forced to walk with a Barbie wherever they went, um, dressed in, you know, what in, in the United States we consider a female color, pink, you know, whatever it was, said that they were boys. And they had even been getting estrogen, some of them, at, because of junior high, at, at junior high, so that they would get breast development. Um, and, um, and they still said they were boys. And, um, and so they, they went and credit to surgeons, they actually went and talked to their patients, and, um, and that's it, they got their New England Journal paper, and the upshot is this. As of the time they wrote their paper, every single kid who knew his gender identity, um, uh, other than one who refused to talk to them because um, of the, the fact that they've been lying, um, to the, to the, um, every one said he was a boy. And they only had left five kids who did not know their medical history or were still living as girls, details not well known. So just striking the failure to be able to coerce somebody to have a different gender identity than it's pre-programmed. And there are a bunch of case series out there um, that kind of look at this stuff, but I, this is kind of the prettiest, <coughs> the prettiest study in term, um, on the subject. Just kind of sw um, moving um, to, um, to other buckets. Um, and for me, the next most convincing bucket is twin studies. And when I say twin studies, there's not a lot of studies. There's not a lot of, uh, transgender medicine's kind of, you know, um, weak broadly. But what this is, this is really one paper summarizing 
recognizing as of the time it was written all the case reports of trans people with twins um, and whether the twin was trans or not. That's the whole dang thing. So basically, the people who, the trans people who had fraternal twins in all the cases in the medical literature as of the time that this paper was written 10 years ago, um, the, the, the twin was relevant point then, and, and, and this is not totally true in the sense that I have patients who are twins or fraternal twins where they're both trans, so it's not absolute, but, 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 um, but still not that likely. Um, by contrast, among those trans kids who had, a, um, who had an identical twin, the identical twin was trans 40% of the time. And if you, um, and, uh, you know, if you, it, the, this is, again, just a, a survey of case reports, but, the, um, but, the, but, but you, um, there's some control for them age, um, everything the same, but somehow if you have more DNA in common, more likely to be trans, less DNA, uh, both be trans, I mean, less DNA in common, less so. And just gets at a little bit of a, of, of a biological connection. It does for those who, um, sometimes we have to educate our, our non-medical um, uh, um, colleagues that identical twins are not really identical, so it's only a 40% um, uh, um, congruence um, rate here. Type 1 diabetes, you get like 50%, PCOS, 70%. Um, identical twins are just really similar twins, is maybe what we should call them. So, um, so the, my, my next little bucket there um, is actually um, the bucket where that gets at mechanism a little bit. Because one thing, you know, it's all well and good to have various associations and say, okay, therefore it must be biology. But um, to me, next steps are to even think about how this even happens, um, where where gender identity even comes from. You know, we just, like you heard me say a few decades ago, I don't think we realized we had gender identity. We just thought we were going with the flow. But what do you know? It's programmed. We find this all across biology. I'm a thyroid guy um, historically. And in, in thyroid forever, we used to talk about the thyroid hormone receptor, and we used to think about thyroid hormone being passively diffused across cell membranes until somebody, um, deter uh, until, the, um, until those cell mem membrane transporters were identified, and we found another sexual reproduction. It's not all about your gametes. What do you know? You need, the, you, you need organs, et cetera, including um, gender identity, uh, knowing what role you're supposed to play, knowing in, in, in quotes here. And so my, my, third, my third item here is in utero androgen exposure data. And it's not like it explains all of gender identity, but so a couple of interesting points So on the extremes. So people who have virilizing congenital adrenal hyperplasia, so XX chromosome, you would predict, you know, 90-odd percent would have female gender identity just by the odds. And um, uh, what, you, what you observe is that if you poll them, depending on who, if you believe the people doing the polling, 5% of those individuals have male gender identity. So still 95% have female gender identity. And you know, there's a source of anxiety among some of the parents with kids who have this virilizing um, um, uh, um, um, experience. And it's still the case that most of those sex individuals will have female gender identity. But 5% but male gender identity is just a far higher percentage of people with XX chromosomes having male gender identity than we see in the general population. So, so there's some predisposition. And more, extra, more striking is the other side of it, which is complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, where your androgen receptor doesn't work. Um, those individuals, you know, the, the, the syndrome includes those elements of your, um, of your visible anatomy that are, that are very much sex hormone dependent, being very viral, uh, uh, being not virilized, so that, um, you know, the lower two thirds of the uh, of vagina is present, and it's so basically the external genitalia look what we consider to be female. And as you hit um, junior high, um, um, if you have adult levels of estrogen and you don't have testosterone active, um, I think of testosterone sometimes as an agent that protects you from having breasts growing. And if you don't have it, then breasts grow as a, as a default proposition. And so those individuals, XY chromosomes, but androgen receptor doesn't work, so they got testosterone floating around. You can measure it, but it doesn't act on their, um, it doesn't act on their tissues, and they, they develop breasts. But the important point for what I'm talking about here is those individuals um, uh, um, overwhelmingly, maybe a couple of case reports um, um, to the contrary, but those individuals overwhelmingly have um, 
uh, female gender identity matching that anatomy that you see. It just suggests that there are, um, that at least for some people, maybe for almost all of us, that you need some testosterone action on your brain at some juncture in order to be able to have male gender identity. And like, like you heard me say, that's as close as I can get to mechanism. Yeah. Um, I guess there I'll, I'll just talk faster if you interrupt me too much. Go ahead. I, I really appreciate you bringing up the CAH patients. And the, the, I actually thought it, I, I've had several patients. Uh, I actually thought it'd be higher than 5%. So maybe it's really higher and we just don't know. But that would be a good thing to, to see these patients. Right. So, so the comment is... Um, a thought that it might be even higher than 5%. And so I will just throw into this, is remember this is, in the, this is in the milieu of the universe in which they're living. And so society is pretty coercive about um, conforming to, certain, to, to, to a certain situation. And if you're a little more non-binary, just let's, you know, let's say there's a spectrum, how, you know, how, how some trans people describe it to us in terms of gender identity, um, it, you know, depending upon where you are in a previous era, you might um, really have to be farther over further over on the spectrum to say that you have a male gender identity. Whereas now, if you say, well, actually, you know, uh, and if we're a little bit more liberal in it, we may, liberal about it, we may actually have um, higher, observe higher numbers. I don't know that they may want to do anything about it, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah, interesting. So just getting a gene thing in the brain. So, you know, so maybe, so I just, you know, I, I just randomly made this, you know, this, 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 this cart cartoon a little bit where there are genes or their epigenetic phenomena that are going to be associated with gender identity in all of us. And I, and I want to be clear, this is in all of everybody's brain. You know, anybody who thinks that they're going to go find, take a bunch of trans people and look at their brains and find something special is going to miss it entirely because that's not it. It's that we all have all of this in these various continua and then it aligns in various, um, in, different, in different directions. And so some of these um, factor, uh, you know, then you can alter testosterone levels is, is, is an action that we observe that can happen. And we can have other factors that, that, that might have influence. And so we end up with, there are going to be some factors that, um, that, that, that give you some, uh, some, some gender identity that's independent of um, action from elsewhere. And there are going to be some factors that are going to be testosterone dependent factors that are influenced by yet other um, by, by, by other inputs um, not yet um, considered and some and maybe some combo factors and I just put this out there as a model if, if we start to explore it maybe we'll find that everybody is in um, all we have is the predisposed influence by testosterone level and the rest of these don't even exist but these are I just put um, posit that these are the options of the kinds of things we might start to look for if we're trying to think about how gender identity operates in, 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 in our brains so last last item last bucket is um, uh, is uh, is kind of the pretty pictures that I like to show lay people mostly because um, the pictures are pretty, um, but the data are a little bit modest. And so it's attempts to find brain anatomy associations with gender identity. And the prettiest pictures, in my view, are still from the 1990s histology slides. Um, and, and they're this. This is an old study. This was done um, on, on, on cadavers at, the, at Mayo Clinic, actually, where what they did is they, um, they were, um, th back then, they were looking for quote, unquote, unquote, gay gene, which I think also misses the point entirely, too, right? Like, I don't think you're going to find such a thing. It's just we probably have some genetic information in our brains that helps us um, have ideas in terms of what kinds of partners we're choosing. And it may be um, somewhat broader, but anyway, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit. But the bottom line is they, um, they're looking for the gay gene ostensibly. So they basically stained this area of the hypothalamus. And they chose this area of the hypothalamus because they had observed it to be associated with rats and mice exhibiting what they perceive to be homosexual behavior, um, like you know, male, mats, male, male rats trying to mate with other male rat, rats. And the only problem, and, and so that whole, that whole line of thinking broke down, um, is um, because what they um, didn't um, do with these rats is they didn't actually talk to the rats. And so <laughs> they didn't know if the rats were gay or trans. And so it was all very confounded. But in the meantime, they, uh, 
they, they looked at the same portion of the hypothalamus in, in humans, and they did this staining, very random staining, by the way. There's no, this is like, talk about a random paper that gets you in, uh, got you in, gets you in nature, but anyway. Um, so cadaver, ostensibly, this is a cisgender man who is ostensibly straight, um, and you get this sort of deep staining pattern, and this is ostensibly a cisgender woman who is, um, I don't think, I don't know if they care about her sexual orientation, um, but is not, um, but doesn't stain, okay? And then they decide that, that the gay man is gonna be somewhere in the middle, that's, that, that's their hypothesis. And so they um, stain um, um, some again, a cadaver, you couldn't talk up to him anymore, um, but historically, ostensibly, he's cisgender and gay. And, um, and he stains exactly like the guy who's cisgender and straight, and so this is negative data. Um, but they were at that time confusing gender identity with sexual orientation, like a lot of people have done. Um, and so um, they found a, um, a transgender woman and stained her brain, and lo and behold, it matches the cisgender woman's brain. So it was very cool, and they went and they did a whole bunch of additional staining and used a bunch of controls for hormones and this, that, and the other thing, got themselves a paper in Nature because they had got the data so robust. Um, and um, so a couple of bottom lines. A, pretty picture with biology associating with gender identity. Nothing causative about this. And I don't think there's anything, any real evidence that this part of the hypothalamus associates with gender identity necessarily. Um, but um, also another important point for anybody going, thinking about research careers and, and science and such, these people were completely confused on the idea of gender identity and sexual orientation. And if you read their discussion, it's a little painful because they don't know what they're talking about. But, um, the, uh, but they did, they were very honest with their data. And so be honest with your data because then later, even if your discussion is, worth, is worthless, um, we will still be able to use your data for subsequent studies. And so just a, a plea in that, in, in, in that direction. All right, so here's therefore the, the cartoon. You know, we kind of thought about, you know, so this is sex, right? You know, so, sex meaning everything in your biology for reproduction, right? So you need some gametes, you need some um, organs gametes or whatever your you know whatever position you have right and um, you maybe need some sex hormone levels to influence those gametes influence whether you, you want to exchange gametes and um, and then I add to that um, you also have to have an opinion about what partners you're looking to um, to engage in your in, in, in your sexual reproduction activities with and we call that sexual orientation and you have to know what role you're playing in this whole process I mean, it's almost easier to conceptualize with animals, right? That if you've got like a bird, you, the the the, the so-called male bird needs to know that it's his job to go, I don't know, fertilize the egg or whatever, and not just to sit on the egg, in which case nothing will happen. Um, and so um, analogously, we have that. And maybe it's a little bit more nuanced in us, but the point is we have that. And you heard me already talk about the terminology. Maybe we should be calling that brain sex or something so that the social science people can have gender identity. But in the meantime, we call it gendered identity. Um, and maybe there's influence by these various things, like, for example, what I already said with sex hormones, maybe playing some role on, in some of the other elements. All right, so if this, is, if this is biology, then let's just go to our next steps. We've got some people where we've got lack of alignment among this biology, no shock. We have that um, when, in people who we re refer to as intersex. We, you know, we, we endocrinology folks um, see this with regard to other elements of our biology as well. Um, and so, um, so, um, so, so just a, a little bit of a side in terms of healthcare delivery, um, where um, thinking about this as a mental health concern had us in this fraught reality where we were forcing the patients to go to mental health providers to kind of convince them that they were really transgender. And then those mental health providers were then casting about for medical and surgical providers to do the interventions. And those of us in establishment medicine all know that we do not treat mental health concerns with interventions uh, that are medical or surgical, we kind of consider that to be abetting their concern. If it's a mental health concern, it requires a mental health solution. Um, and so it created this disconnect within medicine, and it caused the field to be a little bit of a, um, um, a, a little bit of a fringe field, frankly. Um, and if we reframe it a little bit, and, and if you look, it's like, I didn't invent this. This is how we deliver care in general, right? And we medicine folks should be nodding when we look at this because it's basically the patient has what they perceive a need for a medical intervention. Um, and, um, and they go to their, 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 their primary care provider and their primary care provider has experience with the intervention or doesn't. 
of experience with the intervention. But, um, and they can be helpful on their own or they seek their specialist context. So we endocrinologists know how the hormones work and we could be helpful in that space. And those mental health providers can be helpful too because going through all of this may require some conversation on the part of the patient in terms of determining what they want to do or what's really true or where they fit, et cetera. I'm not saying the mental health providers have no job. Their, their jobs are secure. It's just that their role is so different in, 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 in the paradigm. The, um, and then surgeons and other specialists. So what is it that we're actually then doing medically? We're a group of medical folks, so we're, let's talk about like our medical stuff, and I'll talk very briefly like in one slide about what our surgical colleagues do. Um, so, um, so, the, um, so us medical folks are aware of this um, reality, which is that trans people come to attention in late adolescence or adulthood, that is heavily through puberty. Um, and uh, you know, why is that? There's no test, there's no scan. I don't know that there's gonna be a test or a scan anytime, right? You heard me talk about gender identity and all the genes that might be associated and how cool that would be to look at, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna have a test. You know, rheumatology is their fantasy future. It's not, you know, it's, it's not, um, not, 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 coming, not coming soon. Certainly not endocrine where you could just check a TSH and know everything. Um, so, um, so is this, so, so we're dependent on people knowing what gender identity is, appreciating it, and then being able to explain to us in language so that we all believe them and help them with some intervention, right? So how old do you have to be for that to happen? And um, there's a, so there's an articulation and awareness thing, and also I think I, we talked just a moment ago about the CAH people, and if more of them have, more more of them have some male gender identity than we've even appreciated, that you know there's an element of that with 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 trans people too. Um, you're at, most kids are trying to conform. I think most of us in general are trying to conform, right? So they're not trying to be, um, um, th so it takes a while for them to even recognize a where, where there might be some disconnect and they might not want to, you know, they might want to not want to believe it. And it's not, and even when they're well-intentioned, I had a kid just um, um, quite recently, a, trans, a transgender young woman coming to see me kind of in, in, in college. Um, so very male body. Um, uh, telling me that she's certainly a transgender woman, ready for hormones, and um, but telling me kind of her backstory that all through high school she's just been thinking that all boys thought they were girls. Like w she thought she was normal, and everybody, you know, that's just what a normal boy thing. Um, and um, and so you know, there, all of that is happening. You know, even in the best intentioned, most supportive. Bottom line is we're getting these people relatively late vis-a-vis um, um, uh, -vis puberty. Other thing that I want to throw out there that I think you need, that we need to be considering as we're going, going, considering treatment is that um, the, intervent, the people who are looking for interventions, a lot of trans people are not actually looking for much in the way of interventions, but the people who are looking for interventions, hormones and surgeries, really um, are, are a pretty um, hit fertility pretty significantly, and fertility is a priority for a lot of folks, and we do have to be thinking about that in terms of our, um, our strategizing. Right now, we're kind of ad hoc. So, um, well, the cartoon here says, um, and the, um, good Lord, Ethel, you can't appear in public like that. And, um, and so that's the good news about what, when we're trying to change bodies, as as we age, all our bodies become kind of the same. And, and so regardless of your gender identity, and so it's all gonna be okay eventually. But the, um, so the, um, but the question is, what is it, what, you know, is, is for all of us in the interim before we get there? Um, so, um, so this is kind of my favorite picture to summarize part of the impact of hormones. Um, and so this is from, what, a little over 10 years ago. These are identical twins. They're both XY. The one on your left is transgender. And all that's happened, this is just shy of their 15th birthday, but all that's happened as when this picture was taken is that she's received puberty blockers. And so it just kind of accentuates what we think of as a typical female puberty as being kind of this linear aging process. But what we think of as a typical male puberty includes this massive bolus of testosterone at some juncture with this inflection point and all these characteristics that you accumulate pretty precipitously. And so look at him, look at the cisgender kid, because that's actually the point. Um, and you were expecting a little hair over his lip maybe, but look at the squaring of his mandible. Look at all that testosterone action. Um, look at the, you look at, look at, 
look at his larynx, you can envision that his voice is dropped. Look at the musculature on the side of his neck. He's a known quantity. He's known to be a bookworm. When this picture was taken, he was not going to the gym and lifting weights with his head. But, um, um, but that is just testosterone action on the SCM muscles. Um, so, the, um, so, so just something to be aware, because most of our trans feminine people will have, gone, will, have will have acquired some of these characteristics even when they come to us relatively young, and that does influence strategy. And the other thing to know, and this is super important, is we, so many people, our patients, but even some of our medical colleagues, are, are very much into this estrogen versus testosterone, because we kind of learn in this very simplistic way, and it's just not that. Um, we, um, we, um, uh, uh, if you look at your, like, your normal ranges in the lab and things like that, you'll observe that the degree that estradiol is a legit surrogate for estrogens in general, um, we adults have very similar um, estrogen levels. Uh, maybe it's a little higher, typically, what we could typically consider female, but not by much. The big difference is all on the, is all on the testosterone side, where it's maybe a tenfold difference um, in what we consider to be typically male versus typically female. And so what we're doing strategically medically is we're manipulating testosterone. That's an enormous point. We're not giving our, pa our, our trans feminine patients boatloads of estrogen. We're blocking their testosterone. And the guys were given that we are giving them testosterone. So just kind of going down the line real quickly here for the kids, strategically, um, we would like to avoid permanent characteristics if we can. Um, so for the prepubescent kids, there's nothing right now. It's all in the p political stuff about treating you know, children. But we don't, we don't, there's nothing to do for children. They're hormonally indistinct. Um, we don't do anything to them except give people good advice, um, be respectful, things like that. Um, a haircut, you know, clothes they wear, whatever, it depends on the, the group they're hanging out with. Uh, you know, and you can reassure parents and colleagues, by the way, that that's, clothes are, are totally reversible. Um, <laughs> it's, you just give them to the cousin. So um, in case silly as a guy is. Um, but then we have kids who hit puberty, and, um, and, and they hit puberty at an age where it's still, where, where they're a little too young for us to totally believe that they know the implications of what it is that they might be asking for. And so we use this very conservative intervention called puberty blockers, where we delay their puberty for a year or two while we think and consider and spend more time with them and bring in mental health people, which is standard, um, and, and think this through, and sometimes have the, have the parents get on board. Because um, we don't want them to go through the puberty that doesn't match their gender identity if they really are trans, because then we're going to have a whole bunch of characteristics we're going to have to deal with um, you know, in the other direction. Yes? Do you still have to wait until it is like technically 10 or stage 2 before you're allowed to start? Tanner two, and the short answer is yes. So here's the lie about Tanner stages, um, <laughs> which is, um, it's not the lie, but it's like elevators in the United <laughs> States. Um, it begins at Tanner two, okay? Um, Tanner one is like being in the lobby. Um, there is, you haven't begun puberty by definition. That's what it means. So yeah, Tanner two means something happened. The elevator went up a little bit, okay? Um, so, um, so yes, and, the, and recognize too though that that's a floor. That is, there's no point in giving a kid a medication before they even have any puberty. Um, nothing, so that, that's just um, you know, a risk for no purpose. But, the, um, but you don't have to start a Tanner two necessarily either, and I'm not gonna get into that right now. This is beyond scope of what I wanna, I'm talking about right now. We could, get, we could get into that a little bit. We're very focused on GnRH agonists being reversible in case the kid is not trans or doesn't want to otherwise have treatment. We're very still focused on that. And the trans kids, you know, you know, God help them. But the, um, um, and, and, and so, um, and, and in that space, we're very confident about the GnRH agonist reversibility. We've been using it for kids with premature um, uh, uh, puberty for, 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 for um, quite a while, um, uh, for decades, um, um, comfortable in that space. But, but if we're thinking about trans kids, trans kids, and most of these kids who come forward and say they're trans, they are trans. And so we put them on some puberty blockers for a little while, and they really do want more intervention. And actually, there is a little story there, which is, because we're thinking about fertility, maybe for a trans kid, we might have wanted to wait a little bit um, to get them a little more development before we start doing stuff. Um, so anyway, there is a little bit of a story there. But in the meantime, yes, certainly Tanner two is the floor. Um, and what I was just talking, discussion of you know, if the, how well established things are, how clear the kid is about when you can start your sex hormones. All right, for transgender men, 
the treatment is it's no biggie. And for purposes of this talk, I'm going to be completely agnostic how you give the testosterone injections or gels or anything else you got available um, is, is, is OK with me. It tends to be lifelong. Our, um, we endocrine folks can, should be able to help anybody with this because it's how we give testosterone to anybody who needs testosterone. We have the exact same parameters. We follow hem, you know, hematic, you know, we look at the effect on urethropoiesis just the same as, as any, any other person who needs testosterone. So pretty straightforward conceptually at least. Um, for, um, so the, the issue is with, 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 uh, with, with transgender women and the important point is this, blocking testosterone. That is what we are doing. Now, it turns out that um, the, the, uh, um, being hypogonadal is an issue. Um, spending a lifetime hypogonadal is a surefire way to get osteoporosis at a very young age and, and, and maybe other complications, but for sure that, that we have demonstrated. And so we want you to have some sex steroids. Androgyny is not really an option. And so our agent that we use for blocking testosterone is estrogen. And, um, and, and so we, we take estrogens, 17-beta estro, uh, estradiol in 2022, and it feeds back centrally, suppresses the axis in a beautiful way, and what do you know, it floats around in the body and protects your bone as well. So it has that dual purpose role. And it, like in the 90s, we would give people gobs of estrogens, transgender women, gobs of estrogens, because we thought estrogens were like the miracle drug that would save humanity. Um, and um, later, um, there was a women's health initiative where there became some anxiety about potential harms, especially to postmenopausal cisgender women. Um, and um, and, and ba the, the bottom line concern is a little bit of association with um, thromboses with, um, with exogenous estrogens. And so we create these cocktails where we um, have these, um, these adjunct antiandrogens to lower the testosterone or block the testosterone a little bit so we can give a little less estrogen and expose people to a little less risk. And that's kind of the current, the current environment. Right now, here in the United States, we give spironolactone because it was inexpensive in the day when people were scrounging around for support to pay for this. Um, and we still give spironolactone heavily. Why? Because it's 50 or 60 years old, and it has a great safety profile. We, it's a potassium sparing um, diuretic, so we know to keep an eye on the potassium when you adjust doses, especially as people age. But other than that, if they develop New York Heart Association class three or four failure over their lifetime, they actually live longer with spironolactone. So that's like the ultimate safety profile. Um, other agents that could be attractive, though, include those same GnRA agonists that we use for the kids, where you could just suppress the axis and add back the hormones um, that you're looking to do. And then um, the Europeans you, um, use um, a acetate, um, but I have some negative things to say about progestins, and I'll come to that in just a moment. And so some of those negative realities are being backing away from using um, that particular adjunct agent. So basically, estrogens be act beautifully to suppress testosterone, which is the entire goal. So let's just talk about the thrombosis risk a little bit, because I want to put that in perspective, because it's important, because we devoted an enormous amount of energy to worrying about this, and I, and, and I really want to um, reframe in a big way. And so here, you don't have to read all the detail. Just kind of look at the global idea here, where this is a meta-analysis of estrogens given to, all, to, to, to people in all sorts of situations. So it's mostly cisgender women. Um, and um, basically, the purple lines, as they go to the right, they're more thrombotic events. And the take-home points are kind of two or three. First, that the more, whatever the product you use, the more estrogen you give, the more thrombotic events they have. Nice dose-response connection. Um, second, if you add a progestogen, um, then it, things get even worse in a big way. Um, interesting, because I think we devote so much energy worrying about estrogens, where I think progestins probably have an issue themselves that we kind of neglect to worry about. And then the last piece, maybe, if it's an addition, it's the third piece, and this is a maybe kind of thing, is um, same estrogen product, if it's a transdermal product, there are fewer thrombotic events than when taken orally. And in the endocrine world, we have invented something that we call the first pass through the liver effect, where we say, oh, well, it goes through the liver one time, and it stimulates all these clotting factors and predisposes you to clotting. And if you could bypass that, it would be safer. So could be true. I'm open. But I'll just point out that the data don't 
actually show that. What they also show, or, well, well, they don't show anything, actually. I, 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 um, the, the, cons the, the thing I want to point out is that if you ever have given um, any of these agents in a topical product, the transfer across the epidermis is really terrible. And so it could be the case that all you're doing is not delivering a lot of medicine. And then you, um, and really all you're observing then is that same dose response connection where less product, fewer thromboses, and that whole in, um, first pass through the liver thing is um, actually not true, even though it sounds great. So I'm um, kind of, you know, putting put that one out there. So let me just talk though for a moment, because this may be true, but let me talk about absolute harm or ha absolute risk. This is 700 transgender women tra treated with oral estradiol for a couple of years. Um, they had one person who had an event. That's it, not even life-threatening. And so hard to do statistics and not exactly um, lots and lots of trans people keeling over from thrombotic events, from strokes and PE, et cetera. And at Sinai, um, we actually, because the people are saying, well, in the peri in surgery is a, is a prothrombotic time. And so these transgender people come in, some of them for like these vaginoplasties, a major surgery. And the, it, it, we actually recommend in a whole bunch of these guidelines that they hold their estrogens for weeks so that they can be free of estrogens and not have that risk factor. So at Sinai, we had a big argument about whether this even made any sense or not. And the bottom line of it is we had about an 18 month period during which we did almost 500 surgeries where we held their estrogens just like everybody said we were supposed to. And there was one recorded thrombotic event that entire time. It's an academic medical center. We're very aggressive with our post-op VTE prophylaxis. You know, everybody ambulates, really blah, blah. You know, and they wear those legs, legging things. Um, and so that's, that's the result. Eventually, the surgeons pushed back and, and, and kept giving the estrogens to the patients. And um, in that subsequent 18-month period, almost 600 surgeries, we had no recorded events. And the hematology colleagues, I don't know who, if anyone's from heme in the room here, but they were like, well, duh, um, because everybody in hematology knows it's the going back and forth, which is the prothrombotic thing. But if you keep it level, that's actually a better thing. And um, it, we're all looking at the same data, by the way, but it's interesting the different interpretations of those data. Uh, so bottom line, though, is this is just not a very scary or dangerous thing. And just hierarchically, if I go through it, if I've got pregnancy up here. Um, then I've got terminating, terminating a pregnancy down below it. Then I got lifetime risk of oral birth control using ethanyl estradiol, the most thrombogenic estrogen. And then I've got the estrogen used for transgender people. You know, just, you know just, just a little perspective there. All right, so, um, oh, agents. So spironolactone, um, you know, we're medicine folks, so we know about the um, inhibition of the, uh, um, uh, you know, even though it's supposed to be mineralocorticoid receptor inhibitor that acts on AR. And there are, there are two studies in the literature for, um, um, for inhibiting synthesis of testosterone by spironolactone metabolites. GnRH agonists, very clear mechanism, very effective. We had not used it historically because it was a little more expensive. It's still in the great scheme of the healthcare dollar, not very expensive, not compared to um, you know, cancer treatment or heart treatment. Or, and, um, so maybe that's out there as, as, as a possible agent. All right, progestins. Let me just talk about that for a moment because any of you who see trans people are gonna hear, um, are gonna hear a little bit of a push in favor of progestins with the, with the thought process being um, that it's also a female hormone, you, re, re, you, you kind of um, cre you reproduce that milieu. And the only cautions I will give are that um, the, what we actually observe is what I showed you before. When you add progestins to just about any estrogen product, you have increased VT. Um, if you look at women's health initiative data, so which supposedly got us to use less estrogen in post, an older postmenopausal cis women, reality is though that their that study is so huge, they had 10,000 women in study with hysterectomy who did not require progestins because they could have unopposed estrogen. They didn't have to worry about the endometrial lining. The those 10,000 women had less breast cancer and less heart disease than the women who did not take hormones. So same thing, we're also worried about estrogens, but it's the common product women 
who had any of the concerns, and they weren't even such big concerns, frankly. Um, but the pure product women actually did do better. And so it's a ding on intestines and also get, makes me back away from us, our anxiety with regard to estrogens. All right. I said I had one slide on, on, on the surgical options. And um, so, um, and, and, and basically, I have two points to make with this slide. Um, the first is our transmasculine guys, and, and, and this is based on, the, my data are roughly people looking for hormones. Um, what kinds of surgeries are they even looking for? And, um, cause, and I say people looking for hormones because that's the cohort I have. I'm an endocrinologist, so that's who I see. And it's not all trans guys. It's trans guys who want hormones. Um, and um, among that group, more than 90% of them are looking for chest surgeries, masculinizing chest surgeries. However, and this is notable, um, the, remember I talked about the intersex folks, how we, um, we wanted to do a vaginoplasty on everybody because that's the better established surgery, and that is still true now in 2022. These, um, these masculinizing genital reconstruction surgeries are more fraught. We're getting better at them, but they're more fraught. Our patients know this, and so fewer than 10% of them are looking for genital surgeries. And the only little interesting side note there is that um, if, you, um, if you're not doing a, a phalloplasty, you might not even bother with internal reproductive organ surgeries, and your trans guys may be walking around with the uterus and ovaries, which, if you're primary care, you do need to know about because they might need a pap smear. Um, but if fertility is your interest, then it turns out that if your ovaries are sitting there, you could actually, even with a, guy, with a, with a trans guy on testosterone, you could do the same um, um, stimulated egg retrieval procedure as you could on a cisgender woman and pull an egg if that, or a group of eggs for, uh, for IVF if you want to. So, um, so, so that's kind of status on the surgical side for transmasculine folks. And on, for transfeminine folks, um, I, the, the key point is this. The, the genital reconstruction surgery really does work. If you have a good surgeon, you're basically taking, keeping all the nerves and blood vessels and, um, intact and making the penis inside out, more or less, and moving the glands to be um, a, a clitoris and basically just moving, doing all the, you know, reversing um, um, what androgens did once upon a time um, in utero. Um, and um, so that surgery does work. And like, it should look right. It should be functional. You should be, if you were orgasmic before you had the surgery, you should be orgasmic after you have the surgery. So good function. Um, potentially, and so these surgeries are popular with maybe more than half the patients interested in them, but the important point is that things that we think of as cosmetic, like a facial feminization surgery, which through the lens of a cisgender person would be cosmetic, is necessary potentially for a transgender person, especially for some of the older trans women. Walking around looking masculine is, is downright dangerous, and, um, and, so, and, and, and further, some of them are in relationships where their genitals frankly, are not their big concern. That's, work, that's between them and their intimate others, and they've already got a plan, um, as it were. And, um, and so what they're worrying about is the rest of humanity. And, and so facial feminization surgeries can be as important, if not more important, depending upon your transgender population. And just something to be aware of, we're right now in a climate where, forget the haters, because that's its own burden, but among even the supportive folks, you know, your standard Blue Cross, whatever, will say genital surgery, well, that's medically necessary, who would do that otherwise? But facial feminization, that's cosmetic, but you can see that that's not, they're not completely getting it. All right, so health concerns, not a whole heck of a lot. Hypogonadism, we want to avoid it. Um, and we don't want super physiologic hormone levels. We don't want to be stimulating your erythropoiectosis with androgens, or even if it's a small thrombosis risk, accentuating with more estrogen than you need. All right, I, this is my last slide. And the last slide is this. So I've been spent a bunch of time here talking about, you know, a lot of people, when they think about transgender people and what they want to study, they think about the harms of hormones. And I just, I, I, I hope I've pushed back a bunch on that um, because um, the, uh, because I, I don't know that there are a lot of, there's, I don't know that there's a lot of there there to see. There's some cool science, but it's using transgender people as a model for understanding biology in general. Let's say, you know, it's saying, oh, we're going to give a bunch of hormones to somebody who didn't otherwise have them, measure uh, some tissue, and see one, the impact be on anybody. And it's not trans-specific per se, and I'm not worried about that, that there's a harm, or that, that, tra that I'm going to say, oh, well, now this trans person shouldn't get their hormones because of some impact on a kidney or, or whatever it is. So, um, so kind of... Um, not focusing there as much. And when we look at epidemiologic cross-sectional data 
for all the harms that I did not show you because it's, uh, that's like the typical talk that I don't want to give. Um, but it, it is really there where a lot of the transgender women who have more heart disease and such, it's not because of estrogen, I'm going to guess. It's because they have lack of access to care. They don't feel safe. Um, all, you know, what, what, what it sometimes gets labeled by our social science colleagues as minority stress. Um, it's, it's, it's things fitting into that, into that space, classic um, care disparity kinds of, t um, kinds of concerns. And so if you're thinking about research and, you know, what we can learn, we can use trans people as a model to learn about hormones and, I, you know, and we can learn about the brain, about, you know, globally. And we, if we're thinking about disparities, disparities are disparities. And, um, and, and, and that's really maybe the cause of some of the um, epidemi epidemiologically observed um, discrepancies that we're seeing, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain. All right. So I did us right to the hour. And I, I thank you much for, for your attention. Is that you? No, it's my yeah. son. That's okay. Me. <laughs> right, but if it's a real picture, I, I'm not going to tell you which highway department came up with that. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I love how this was evidence based, and you brought in a lot of articles. Some of them are from a little bit further back, and. More often, um, we hear about non-binary, and is there much in the literature now about how that plays in, and is, is there any sort of research or recent evidence, um, and as you talk about gender, what are your thoughts on non-binary, microdose or low T, or yeah. micro T? Yeah, so thoughts about um, uh, where non-binary stuff fits in. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, um, I, I guess, so, so from, a sheer, from a pure medical, biological perspective, actually, where all of these things might be multifactorial, and so when things are multifactorial, you create lots of opportunities for a continuum. And so the idea that, there, that people would, rec would, would define that as non-binary is really surprising to me. It's interesting to me to look at my patients where, 10, 12 years ago, nobody was non-binary. Everybody was very binary in their labeling, but they asked for some of the same stuff, including some of the things you just talked about, things that were a little more on the spectrum from a treatment perspective. Um, now, I don't, need, don't know that there's an uptick in that. I'm not, I, I'm not necessarily seeing that. I'm seeing a lot more young people walking in and telling me they're non-binary and they use they pronouns, but it just shows you, I almost have to ask a separate question. It's almost why I said that we maybe need two words now for gender identity, Identity, that is how you label yourself, and um, gender identity, meaning whatever your, you know, whatever your brain sex biology would be to the degree that we have any sense of that or you can, person can actually. And, and, and the point then ends up being that I have two questions. You know, what are your pronouns and, you know, how are you labeling yourself, basically? And, um, and, but that doesn't get me anything. I still don't make any assumptions. And I say, oh, and what are we doing? Because I have yeah. enormous numbers of, of they pronoun non-binary people saying, oh, yeah, I'm here for co conventional testosterone or vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's about as much as I would say. And then from an endocrine perspective, the key... Um, concept is hypogonadism is a problem. People who want me to ablate their gonads at a young age and leave them exposed to a lifetime of that, n really a problem, okay? Not okay. But along a continuum of sex steroids from a very male profile, we, we would call it, or a very, to a very female profile, I don't think I've got a reason to argue anything, one being better than the other or anywhere along the line. So if somebody wants that, I don't care what their entire logic pattern is, just as long as they're consistent, you know, and I'm and I'm believing that they're that they're legitimately, you know, gender diverse, doing this in a in a, you know, there's an, other, another mental health concern that I'm accidentally abetting, which is pretty not, free, you know, not typically the thing. Then yeah, if somebody wants in, they want like a little androgen. The only ca further caution I will say is that all of our biology and its sensitivity to hormones is heterogeneous. So if I've got somebody who says, oh, I am, let's say an XX individual who says, oh, non-binary, I want just low-dose androgens. Mm -hmm. and, I was, and I would say, okay, that's fine. I wouldn't do hypogonadal, but kind of a little mix there that kind of uh, is, is somewhere on some spectrum. The caution is the person, the rest of the person's biology might be very binary. And so they, and I, it's, my, it's my Murphy's Law rule. 
which is my trans women who want big breast development, they get nothing. And it goes on for years, okay? And my, um, my person who talks, like you just said, they walk in and I give them, a, I, I, they open the testosterone, they have not even done the injection, they already grew a beard. Yeah. And they just better be ready for that. Yes, yes, that's a good point. Do we have any use of GNRH for increasing height in, in a shorter child or a physiological shorter patient? Uh, delayed puberty, you know, the delayed puberty is associated with the better heights. Yeah, so the, um, so the short answer is I don't know any uh, of people doing this in a careful way. The concept has been considered, especially when you're giving kids like growth hormone with, with height deficiency, and could you, could you use that? Part of the problem. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's all a little multifactorial, and I haven't seen anybody f actually with a formal protocol doing that. I guess it's about as much as I could say right now. And we don't know. Very confounded. There's a couple of papers that came out with height with regard to GnRH agonists out of the Netherlands um, just this past fall. Um, but they're massively confounded because they give the kids present really late. And so they got a whole bunch of people who ended up closer to the height you might have predicted with an earlier puberty. But then you look, they weren't tan or two. You know, they were tan or three and four. And they already were following a bit of a puberty, you know, of, 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 a, of, a, of a puberty before it went. So it's confounded. I had a, I saw a post somewhere, and I'm not saying I agree with this, but I thought the question was interesting from another person. Um, that said that there was that they have noticed an escalation in trans men over the past few years, and in the past it used to be more trans women. And I know there's a lot to talk about in this post, um, which was on a medical like conversation, social media thing. Um, is there any data that compares sort of you look at assigned female at birth, assigned male at birth? Like, are we seeing? And I know that gender is fluid and there's a spectrum, but I mean, in your practice, would you say it's sort of, if you're looking at trans males and females, it's 50-50, or are you seeing a difference? So, um, so a couple things. Um, so first of all, I don't, people say fluid all the time. I don't observe much fluidity. I see a lot of spectrum, but, okay. yeah. but, it, but, but everybody says it, but I... But um, anyway, so uh, but I think it, it's that's like a party line statement almost. Yeah. So yeah. the um, so with regard to the shifting ratio kind of yes. thing. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, b bunches of thoughts. I, I get this heavily from people who are trying to undermine our care, and yes. it comes from a bad place. Topic. Exactly. And mm -hmm. so that's not helping me because I want to be thinking about this as a scientist and what's yeah. really true. And um, and so. Th sticking to that, to, to a constructive um, conversation, um, then um, you can envision, first of all, that uh, in, in our society, our acceptance of, of, of more masculine presentation yes. um, uh, was higher among, among uh, and, and, and might have been sufficient, especially if you envision a continuum of gender identity for some more masculine gender identity folks who now are coming forward and identifying themselves as trans, but were okay with just dressing more masculine for where they were in their gender identity in a different era. Um, and um, uh, so you can, you can kind of envision that kind of thing happening, and now we're seeing a little more therefore. Um, people worry about this, where, where we are in such a sexist society, you know, as my trans feminine yeah, colleagues yeah. point out to me, yeah. they're like, you know, when we get over the transphobia, yeah. um, we're all still going to be really sexist. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and, um, and so they, they, they talk about that kind of situation where people who are a little bit, again, maybe on a spectrum, it's worthwhile just to have the whole world treat them as masculine. Yeah. Yeah, label yeah, themselves I, in a more binary masculine mm -hmm. way, right. um, and they get some ulterior motive. And that makes some people nervous, because they don't, the ulterior motive thing worries people. Then yeah. are you doing this for the right reasons? Yeah. Um, but there may be a component of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, the hour, I think we're 10 yeah. minutes over, yeah. right? So good. Thanks a lot. I was wondering if someone else all right. Yeah, they did. So we can. <laughs>